This is the Buttercup Podcast, where we talk about early childhood topics. I'm the host of the Buttercup Podcast, and my name is Marisa Macy. I'm super excited today because I have Dr. Edward Malwish from the UK joining us. And I just want to read to you a, a brief bio because he is incredible, and uh, I just want you to know a little bit about him. He is Professor of Human Development at the University of Oxford. He has been the director of the National Evaluation of Sure Start, Effective Preschool Primary and Secondary Education, and SEED projects. He is currently undertaking longitudinal studies of 4,000 children in England and Norway. These studies contributed to social policy in the UK for families, early year services and education, including universal provision of preschool for all three and four year olds, and establishing 3,500 children's centers, every child matters, and 10 year childcare strategies, and early education for two year olds for the 40% most disadvantaged. He has given evidence to parliamentary committees and is an advisor to research councils in Norway, Finland, Portugal, Germany, Netherlands, Australia, Korea, Canada, USA, Chile, the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, and the World Health Organizations. Dr. Malwish, thank you so much for being with me today. It is such an honor to talk with you. It's a pleasure. Okay. How did you get started in the early childhood education field? Well, um, after I graduated with a bachelor's degree, I, um, I had children and I did a PhD on early perceptual and cognitive development in infants and how that affects their social development. And then shortly after that, I then, did some uh, teaching work. And after that period, I then took up a job in London, uh, which was uh, funded by the Department of Health in London to look at uh, a longitudinal study of children who uh, were experiencing various forms of daycare. And that work uh, illuminated uh, how the quality of daycare can affect children's development, and then affected uh, an act of parliament, which introduced new regulations on childcare inspections uh, in the UK. Um, so I, then I moved on to uh, other work in European based work, where I work collect collaborations with various colleagues in Europe, where we looked at childcare in different European countries. Um, around the end of the 1990s, uh, I joined a group of colleagues to work on a project which became absolutely groundbreaking called the Effective Preschool, Primary and Secondary Education Project. This is a longitudinal study of three of 3,000 children in England. And the reason it was groundbreaking was that nobody had undertaken a longitudinal study of this size looking at uh, early education and, and childcare in particular. And we were able to demonstrate that those children who had some kind of early education experience uh, before they started school were, were doing better at the start of school. And that led the government to introduce new legislation to provide free preschool education for every three and four year old in the whole country which is a dramatic change because up to that time, everything happening before preschool was largely down to what parents wanted to pay for and the state provided very little. So this was really groundbreaking. And, uh, and having made that investment, the government then felt committed to uh, try to improve these services that they were paying for. And so they put a lot more money into training and uh, development of services in early childhood. Um, and that went to the, um, also led to what we call the Shore Start Project, which was a massive intervention project for disadvantaged families with young children. And uh, I directed the evaluation of that work, which showed that a particular model of preschool services, 
which we call children's centers, um, which in incorporate early childcare, preschool education, parenting support, and often health services as well, all under one umbrella, was particularly effective in producing good development in children, in particular disadvantaged children. And that led to the development of children's centers, um, which are now, our, new, uh, our latest government now call them family hubs, but they're basically the same service structure. And we've seen this now in several European countries have started to mimic this model of, of service development. And it is very successful. Let me give you a little anecdote. Um, I was asked by the European Commission to evaluate uh, children's services across Europe with some various colleagues across Europe. And I was, as part of this project, we were asked to pick out one example of good practice in each of the relevant European countries. So I picked out a children's center in the UK. And I picked this out uh, because it was serving an extremely deprived community in East London. And what was interesting about this children's centre was it provided pregnancy care by midwives, uh, early health care through health visitors, children's nurses, child care for those mothers who wanted it, and preschool education, and also a primary school. So everything from conception through to the end of primary school came under one, um, one service umbrella, which meant that the parents could easily relate to these services as their children were getting older without having to give lots of extra information to new people every time, because every, you know, they, they, they were all integrated under the same umbrella. Now, when we, when we did a, this, a case, this case study, we found that uh, the people working in this service, like midwives, health services, childcare workers, preschool teachers, and so on, all love this model of, of provision. Now, midwives are, are notoriously uh, awkward profession. You know, they go their own way and, you know, you have to live with it, that sort of thing. Um, <laughs> and so I was quite surprised to see the midwives really taking to this new way of uh, delivering services. And they, they said they much preferred it to the more traditional method of service delivery. And this is true of other professions as well. And, we, and the parents loved it and you know, everybody seemed to really enjoy this, this model. Now, we, we then published that case study. Um, but what was interesting, a year later, the government did one of their annual surveys where they compare the educational progress of children in every primary school in the country by measuring development at the start of school to the end of school, then adjusting it by the intake characteristics of the school and seeing how much progress overall each school is getting for its children. And then they produce a league table, you know, which are the best schools in the country, which are the average, which are the, 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 the low schools. I mean, you, everybody can look at this. It's on the website. And so everybody can look at this. Now, what, what was interesting is the primary school attached to this particular children's center, completely unexpectedly, except for me, from my point of view, scored top to the whole country. Its children were making more progress than any other primary school in the country. And that's a very good illustration of how a children's center can have long-term benefits for children. Yes. Uh, so that then after that work, I uh, the, the, the short stuff and uh, affected primary, preschool, primary, and secondary education project. I then moved on to more European work, working with colleagues in in European countries, looking at. Uh, inequalities in children's services across Europe, and also looking at early childcare and, and education across Europe. And that has affected various recommendations that the European Commission has made to European countries. More recently, I've done a new project where we followed up 5,000 children in England, where we've looked at their early childcare and early education experiences and how they affect 
their longer term development. And that found rather different results to our earlier study. And what, the, what was interesting was that the effect of preschool was rather reduced now than what it was earlier on. But we also looked at the quality of the provision as it was back when we did the original uh, studies back around 2000 and as they are now. And what we found was the quality of services overall had improved across the board. And almost all the poor quality services which we saw around 2000 had been almost, almost uh, uh, abolished. They, they just didn't exist anymore to a large extent. And so what was happening was everybody was getting preschool education of some kind, uh, but they, they, we weren't getting any children with very low quality provision. And so we had children having mediocre to high provision. And within that range, we had smaller differences than we observed earlier, when we had some children who had no preschool, some children who had very low quality preschool, and some children who had very high quality preschool. And so the, the differences reduced, and also the quality has improved. And we also have found that the overall performance of children entering school in England has increased in the last 20 years as a result of this uh, universal provision of preschool education. And the OECD now recommend that every OECD country in the world, which includes America, of course, should provide universal preschool for every child from at least three-year-olds upwards. Because the, the benefits are very so clear-cut in every country where it's been studied. Yes. There's been a recent study in Boston, for example, which finds very, very positive benefits for preschool education. Yes. Well, thank you for your research. And uh, it's so interesting. Uh, uh, the work that you've done on quality of early childhood services, low and high quality, uh, and yeah. also longitudinal research designs. Uh, I did uh, an interview uh, with Craig Ramey, Dr. Craig Ramey uh, here in America, who did uh, the Abecedarian Project. And mm -hmm. I asked him, how, how do you keep track of all of the participants in your study? Because that's a lot of people. And you have thousands and thousands and thousands of people in your studies. Uh, do you have any advice for people who are either reading longitudinal research designs and want to get kind of a behind the scenes how it all works or people who want to embark on longitudinal research? Well, longitudinal research is um, quite difficult compared to other types of research because you have to you know, be in it for the long term. You have to commit yourself early on to that one. Now, what you'll do is you apply, you need substantial funding to do a reasonably a reasonable longitudinal study because they're quite expensive to run. Now, most funding agencies, which are typically government agencies of one kind or another, will not fund for more than a few years at a time. So what you do is you set up a, a short-term longitudinal study, say for three years. Then if everything's going smoothly after about three years, you then say, OK, everything's going well now. You've invested all this money in this, in this new project. It seems a great shame to waste this investment. So why don't we carry on for another three years? And if it's still going well, we, you know, we, you can review the process. Then. And so what? They'll, they'll fund you for another three years, then another three years, and so on. And eventually, before you know it, it's 20 years. <laughs> <laughs> yes, carry on. <laughs> uh, so. Um, that's generally the, the situation uh, for most longitudinal studies. When you do longitudinal studies as well, you have to think about that there are different kinds of longitudinal studies. Uh, I'm involved with some, uh, a study with some collaborators both in the UK and China at the moment, where we're doing what we call, might call a general purpose longitudinal study. We've got uh, about 12,000 children in England and about another 12,000 or so in China. Wow. And we're collecting data on these children from birth onwards. And we are collecting data on their background, on their family backgrounds, their health backgrounds, and 
a range of factors related to their early experiences, and we're going to be following them all the way through school, hopefully. Now, we haven't got specific hypotheses there about what may affect their later development. Uh, but what we're looking at is by collecting data on a wide range of factors, we can see how uh, these factors affect development over, over the long term. <coughs> and <coughs> the UK has a long tradition in these long, types of longitudinal studies. They started back, the original ones in 1948, and there was another one in 19. 58, and then another one in 1970, another one in 2000, and another one now starting now in 2021. Um, and these studies have been very influential on policy in the UK. For example, um, there's a general recommendation now that no mother who's pregnant should smoke. Okay. Mm -hmm. The reason for that recommendation is that these longitudinal studies found that children many years later were doing worse if the mother had smoked in pregnancy than if she had to smoke in pregnancy. Wow. Uh, and that's just one example of that. Uh, and then we, we, you find a whole range of uh, in, uh, factors linking early experiences of children and, uh, and uh, their longer term development, which can be very helpful in planning services in early childhood, because you can know what's going to make a difference in the long term. Now, some of the long term studies I've done have been much more focused, uh, like the effective preschool primary and secondary education project was focused on the effective particular of preschool education, as was the seed study that I did later on. Uh, and they collected data on a whole range of factors, but they, we made sure that we had very detailed data on the preschool education and childcare services that those children received, because that was a particular focus of the study. <clears throat> what also comes out of these uh, longer children studies is a tremendously powerful influence of parenting. Parenting is the single most influential factor on a, on a child's long-term development. Things like, uh, I invented the concept of what we call the home learning environment, where we looked at uh, various activities in the lives of children. And what we found was that there were certain activities which, which are consistently linked with the children's educational and cognitive development. And when we looked at what was it about these particular set of activities which were, had this link, and the, the, what it was, was that these, these are activities all offered a learning opportunity for the young child. Things like reading to the child, drawing, child drawing or painting, the child learning a song, a poem, a nursery rhyme, dancing, uh, the, a child uh, learning about numbers, learning about letters, and so on. Uh, all of these things, these things offer learning opportunities for children. And we find that in homes where there are more of these learning opportunities, the children show better longer term development across the board. We also find that things like um, the patterns of discipline parents use in early childhood, and we, in, we call it limit setting, where the child, where the parent puts some kind of structure on the range of behavior which the child uh, gets rewarded for. And that structuring of the child's experiences uh, can be very influential on both the child's cognitive and emotional development, generally leading to better outcomes. And another major factor is uh, parent-child warmth, the warmth in the relationship, the, the strength of the uh, emotional relationship between a parent and child. That's also uh, very important as well. I could go on and on, on about that, but I just wanted to do, illustrate how important parenting is in early childhood. Yes, and uh, you have some uh, beautiful videos that parents and early childhood educators can use from Story Park. Do yeah. you uh, want to share about that resource? 
Well, the Story Park asked me to do some uh, videos for them uh, to uh, illustrate some of those points. And um, they have specifically designed for parents and for uh, early, early childhood educators or childcare workers, people who work with children in early childhood. Um, and uh, Story Park did this as part of their sort of philanthropic uh, endeavors. That is, while they are a private profit-making organization, they also like to do some good as, it were, as well. And so they made these videos as, as a way of uh, you know, doing some good in the world, yes. Yes, and uh, you've talked about your longitudinal scholarship, and you're also known for the intervention research studies that you've done. And uh, one of your uh, famous quotes is, interactions drive development. Right. Can you talk a little bit about that? Okay. Um, when we look, for example, at the quality of early child care and the quality of preschool education and how that influences children's development, we found that the factors which differentiate the centers which have the best results are overwhelmingly related to the patterns of interaction the children have with uh, the staff or the adults present. Let me give you an example of this. In one of our longer children's studies, we were able to pick out some centers which were producing better results for their children than other centers. And in other words, they were highly effective centers. So we thought to ourselves, what is it about the highly effective centers, as opposed to other centers, more average or low, low effective centers, which differentiates them? So what we did is we picked out a group of high effective centers and a group of not so effective centers. Uh, and we then had qualitative researchers go into those centers to look at what was happening in those centers. So they'd interview the staff, they'd interview the parents, they'd make observations of everyday activity in these centers and so on. And they typically would spend a case study of about three weeks at a time in any given center. But they didn't know which were the effective centers and which were the not effective centers. So we're doing this blind, as it were. But they then brought all their results back to the office. And the, the, when they brought their results back to the office, we said, OK, now we'll tell you which were the effective centers and which were the not effective centers. And let's see in your case notes if there's anything which differentiates them consistently. And we found a variety of factors which differentiated the highly effective centers. Um, for example, the uh, quality of verbal interaction between the, the staff and the children, the knowledge of child development by the staff, uh, how good the staff are, were, were dealing with conflicts with between children, and also how good the staff were, were um, collaborating with the parents, providing parents with hints about what they might do at home to help the child's learning and development. Um, but there was one kind of interaction which we only ever saw in the highly effective senses. And we call this sustained shared thinking. My colleague Aram Siraj did the, uh, the primary qualitative work on this. And the sustained shared thinking is a particular kind of interaction where an adult and a child work together to solve a problem or create something new. But the child takes the lead and the adult provides supporting information to enable the child to progress in solving the problem or creating a new toy or whatever it may be that they're making. And these interactions may take place for five minutes, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, or even longer. They're not short. They're, you know, they're quite take, over, take place over an extended period. And you see how the, the adult is scaffolding the environment to suit the child's immediate needs so that the child can 
grasp the next step in the learning process. And this, um, if you, the Russian psychologist Vygotsky had a, a term for this, the zone of proximal development. And basically what the adults were doing in this essential thinking is keeping the environmental input such that it was just within the child's zone of proximal development. And that meant the child could learn from the interaction a great deal. And we see it also in, uh, on the emotional side as well, where, where there's strong uh, emotional bonds between the children and the staff, then they, uh, children tend to uh, be happier and, and benefit more. So when you break down what is it about the environment? And it's true of the parenting practices I was talking about. The parenting practices I talked about earlier were basically boiled down to patterns of interaction with the child. And that's what I mean by interaction child development, because whenever you look at an environmental input which affects the development of the child, almost always it has to do with the pattern of interaction the child is exposed to. That's great, thank you. Are there any innovations or research that you're excited about today? Well, I'm quite excited about this new project, the one Richard Longshun study in, uh, in the UK and, uh, and China, because these are two dramatically different cultures. And uh, we're collecting equivalent measures in both countries. Um, we've got UK funding in the uh, in the case of the UK, and we've got Chinese government funding in the case of China. And uh, it's very new. I can't tell you any about, about results. We have no results to tell anybody at the moment because it's only just it's only just been going in the last year. But uh, I think that might be very interesting to see how. Some processes, um, I guess, will operate very similarly across those very different cultures, but other processes will differ in the way they affect children. And learning about how that happens will be a very big step forward in, in uh, our understanding of childhood in a cross-cultural context. Yes, and your work with global education and partners all around the world is amazing. Yes. Uh, uh, how do those, Partnerships come about? Well, when we did the, um, there, were two, there were two ways in which they came about primarily. When we did the effective preschool, primary, and education project, it was so groundbreaking. Nobody had done anything equivalent anywhere in the world previously. And this effect on policy was so dramatic that other countries around the world started to pick up their ears as it were. Hang on, something's, something's happening here, we should know about. It. And so they would invite me to come and talk to them. Then when we started the Shore Start project in the UK, and I was the director of the evaluation of Shore Start, Shore Start was a tremendously innovative intervention. However, one of the problems with Shore Start is it was very, um politically influenced that is it came from a it, uh, it came from a particular perspective of how the state should provide services for children which uh some politicians found easy to accept others didn't and so well, what we found was when there was a change of government, the support for short start fell off dramatically because they felt that this, this, this was a, a project which was the child, as it were, of the previous government. Therefore, we don't, we don't want to support it because it's a, a different political philosophy. What happened 10 years later is that they then realized, hang on, that service is, was <laughs> really quite good and, and they've now reintroduced the service but under a different name they now call it family hubs uh, but <laughs> you know it's a way of providing allowing the politicians to as it were eat their words but still save face because they called it a different name 
Um, um, so the Shaw Start work attracted a, a tremendous amount of international interest. And again, because of the international interest, I, uh, I was attracted, uh, uh, um, invited abroad to give talks to a variety of governments. And also the international organizations like OECD, the World Health Organization and the European Commission all wanted to know more about this. And I collaborated with all of them in producing publications, uh, uh, which, which described the research and the policy recommendations from the research for international audiences. And because OECD were publishing this sort of work, and many governments around the world are very heavily influenced by OECD. They, of course, then thought, oh, this chap's mentioned in this OECD work. Let's invite him over and see whether we can learn anything from him. And so I did a, I did a fair bit of work with other countries. Uh, for example, Victoria uh, in Australia has introduced free preschool education for every three-year-old upwards, started in starting actually just about it, this year actually it becomes the policy was introduced just before the covid lockdown but it's now starting to actually happen as it were in this in this current year uh based on our on the research that we did there and uh, the that case in australia is probably going to generalize across the whole of australia within a few years my guess is within five years, every other Australian state will have followed the uh, Victoria example. Um, so this, it's by publishing work in places where it's readily visible internationally, like in articles in Science or uh, Lancet and those sort of journals, which are very, very well known internationally, and by having uh, citations of your work by international organizations like the OECD, WHO, the European Commission, so that of course then leads uh, people abroad to think, oh, this sounds interesting, we must learn more about this. And that's what leads to the collaboration with the other countries. And I, whenever I work with other countries, I always seek out people in those countries who have a similar interest to myself so that they can carry on the work on a local basis within those countries. That is an excellent strategy. Mm -hmm. uh, wonderful. And I think uh, a lot of us who start off in the field of early childhood education, we don't maybe realize when we're students <laughs> that advocacy is going to be part of our, yeah. our career. Uh, and I think, uh, here in America, we have a, a professional organization uh, called uh, National Association for the Education of Young Children, and they yes. have uh, power to the profession and uh, resources and workshops and different ways you can become an advocate for young children and families. And we just had a um, conference in Washington, D.C., and uh, we had a speaker uh, uh, who uh, was talking with us. And uh, that speaker was uh, sharing ways that we could uh, uh, amplify our voice in our field. Uh, is, are there any strategies you have found uh, for uh, supporting and advocating for young children and their families? Okay. Now, you could argue on the basis of the research that what we do with young children affects our long-term development. Therefore, on a purely moral stance, we should all do what we can to make the lives of children as best as they possibly can be. That's purely just a moral issue. Now, if you present that moral issue to a politician, they'll say, oh, that's a nice idea, and they'll ignore you. <laughs> However, there's an economic argument. If, let me give you an example of this. China has publicly stated it intends to be the economic superpower of the world by 2050. 
Okay. Now, in order to be the economic superpower by 2050, they will need a population which is highly educated. Okay. Now, who are the population of 2050? The children of the dead. So what we've seen in China in the last 20 years is a massive investment in early childhood education in China. And I talked to the Minister of Education in China back in 2008, and I asked them, why were they starting this, uh, you know, this dramatic increase in spending in this area? And it became apparent to me from the answers they were giving, that they saw it primarily as a vehicle of economic development. That is, if you want a country to have a high level of economic development, you need a certain infrastructure to be present for that country. And early childhood education is an essential part of the infrastructure for a, a long-term successful country in economic terms. Yeah. Now, in the USA, you have pre early child education for, uh, freely available in some states, but many states don't. And in, you know, across the various US states, there's a, a whole mixture of provision, a mixture of support services being provided by the relevant governments. If you look, at the relevant, the relative economic performance of those states is closely related to the investment in early childhood education. Now, that, so there's an economic argument. There's another part of this economic argument which has to do with intervention. One of the benefits of early childhood education is it reduces things like criminality. I mean, you had Craig Ramey talk to you previously. And you know, one of the things from their studies is that criminality is reduced by early childhood education. Um, educational attainments improved. And a whole range of factors, mental health improved. Special educational needs, which I published a paper not so long ago where I showed that high quality early childhood education can reduce the incidence of special educational needs by nearly 60%. Uh, and, and special educational needs are tremendously costly to the educational system. Now, when my neighbor commits a crime, I pay for it. I pay for the police, I pay for the courts, I pay for the prison system. So even though I didn't do anything, I'm still paying for the problems of my neighbor. So if I can reduce criminality, if I can reduce unemployment, if I can reduce uh, so social alienation amongst people, if I can improve mental health of the population, etc. The whole population benefits because they pay out less in social service support and health support and justice system support, etc. So there are, there are long term savings from investment in early childhood. The problem is that these long term savings don't come about typically till about 20 years after you've made the investment. Okay. Unfortunately, politicians only look ahead to the next election. So when you when you suggest a policy change to a politician, they say, "Is this going to uh, affect? Can I see? Am I going to see the effects of this before the next election?" And well, you know, most of the time, you have to say, "No, it's going to take a bit longer." Than that. <laughs> <laughs> and therefore, a politician in those circumstances will often get, get difficult to get them on board. But you do get some politicians who have a much more long-term perspective. You know, uh, I can think of, you know, uh, um, this, you can think of some of the uh, US presidents clearly had um, a long-term perspective in a way they were planning policy. Uh, another, there's a purely, you know, they were out to win the next election, that's all they cared about. Uh, but when those particular politicians who are in power the long term, more people with a long term perspective. That's a window of opportunity. Yes. Okay. 
you should have your case ready, prepared, ready to go. So that when that window of opportunity opens, you can make your pitch. Because these windows of opportunity don't hang around for very long. Okay? You need a politician in power who has a long-term perspective. You also need a relatively favorable economic environment. You will not get new policy developments at a time of recession. Because you know, everybody's so worried about just getting the economy back on track, they won't do it, they won't pay attention to anything else. But when the economy is going reasonably smoothly, that's when you can get policy change. But you'll only get that policy change if you have a, of the kind we're talking about, if you have a politician in power who adopts a long-term perspective. So it's the it's the coming together of those factors which will lead you to be most influential. Thank you. Those are excellent uh, things to think about. And uh, what, your words are beautiful and uh, so important what you're saying about uh, ways we can advocate for young children and families and um, uh, being aware of and having done our homework because when that window opens, <laughs> be ready because you never know uh, uh, when you can uh, really uh, uh, make an impact. Um, yeah. And what you were talking about is kind of playing the long game and looking into the future. And um, and I'm, I was just thinking about Yuri Bronfenbrenner's work with ecological systems theory. And, uh, and the chrono system is over time. And over time, we can you know, plan long term, but also uh, the here and now, short term, uh, uh, benefits of early childhood education are parents being able to to leave their home and go to work and uh, oh, be a yeah. member of the workforce uh, because without yeah. early childhood education and care uh, our, our communities suffer and our neighborhoods suffer and uh, the economic impact that early childhood uh, yeah. care and education makes today uh, and we don't even have to wait 20 years. We we know like right now what happens because yeah. we just lived through the pandemic. And uh, when parents don't have childcare and education for their children, our yeah, communities right. yeah. are, are not able to prosper. Yeah, they, the, the, the biggest short-term economic benefit is in terms of increasing uh, parental employment, uh, involvement in the workforce, because that that also increases the productivity of the, of, the, of the population, but it also has payoff for the government because they get increased taxes because of the increase. <laughs> uh, <because laughs> you know, more, more people employed, they pay more taxes. Everybody benefits from early childhood <laughs> education. <laughs> Accountants, CPAs, uh, <laughs> the IRS. I don't know what you call the but IRS is, in England. Yeah. Yeah, in, in, in the USA, there's a, an organization called the National Institute for Early Education Research, based in New Jersey, and a chap called Steve Barnett runs that, and that produces some very interesting work along these lines, uh, which I think is has has had some he's had they've had some uh, advocacy uh, successes with uh, some governments in the US, and I, I, their work is excellent. Yes. Yes, Dr. Barnett's work is excellent. Well, uh, 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 my last question for you, Dr. Malwish, uh, I, I love talking to you. I could talk to you for hours and hours and hours, uh, but we're coming to, to the time. Um, what's been the highlight of your career so far? Oh, the highlight would have been introducing universal preschool education for every child in the country. That would be the, you, know, the, you have to pick up one thing. That would be the one biggest thing, because that, that, that policy has now affected the lives of many millions of children in a positive way. Uh, and, you know, it's you know, everybody acknowledges, you know, the politicians themselves acknowledge that our work was critical in the introduction of that policy. And that policy has been, you know, there are, Six, roughly 650,000 children every, for every year group in England. 
So you add that up over several years, and it soon amounts up to many millions of children, just in England. Wow. Well, then when you add on the other countries, which have also been influenced by that research, and then you know, it increases dramatically more again. So that would, I, in that sense, I, can, I think I can legitimately say my work has had benefits for the lives of millions of children worldwide. And that, and that would be the single most uh, um, thing I would regard as my greatest contribution, as it were. Thank you, Dr. Malwish, for all your work and your service. And that is epic. Universal Preschool is just uh, such a huge accomplishment and <laughs> uh, amazing what you uh, what you have done. Well, uh, how can Buttercup listeners follow you? Say that again. You, how should people follow me? Or well, my students. Uh, this what? is for my students. My uh, audio podcast. Uh, right. And uh, if they want to follow more of your work, uh, are you going to be oh. at, at any conferences coming up or? Well, the um, NAEYC obviously do very good conferences. Also, the SRCD, Society of Research and Child Development, do some very good conferences. Those are in the USA. Um, there are also international conferences in, uh, in Europe and other countries, uh, which also, uh, you know, uh, you, you can attend. Uh, I retired last year. So Congratulations. Not, yeah. Congratulations. I, uh, I still do some work. I'm on a, you know, a, a ad hoc part-time basis, like the long term studies we're doing. In, um, but my full-time involvement now has gone, and therefore I'm producing less publications now than I used to. But um, if you look at my website, you will see where you know, where my publications are, are coming out, and um, any Google search will, of my name will come up with a whole range of things that you can you can see. Uh, a lot of my work has been published in gov government publications, uh, which are available for that free download on the government websites. So uh, that's a good place to get. Uh, detailed records of, of the research. Yeah. Excellent. Well, thank you so very much, Dr. Malwish. It's been such a pleasure speaking with you and thank you for all of your, your work in early childhood education. Okay, well, it's been a pleasure talking to you today. I hope you all enjoyed it. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Malwish. Okay, bye-bye then. <laughs>